and welcome to episode 118 of Radio Ball Press. I am your host, Rosie, and with me as ever are my co-hosts, Sarah and Phil. Hello. Yo. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm thrown because there are a bunch of fireworks that just started going off oh, right okay. behind me, like a second before we uh, introed. That's your entrance music. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was our fanfare. We set that up. We set that up specifically for you. Oh, amazing! I feel like a wrestler. <laughs> what would my um? What would your song into the ring be if you were a wrestler? Well, apparently, Phil's would just be copying John Cena, <laughs> and mine wouldn't be music. It would just be fireworks, as we've now uh, learned. Mine would be Eddie Murphy party all the time. Of course, it would. Solid choice. Obviously, excellent. I'm glad we got that out of the way. <laughs> Because it's so wrong, and I do not want to party all the time. <laughs> My um, girl wants it's, to it's, it's sleep that, all that, the time. It's that song. Have a lovely nap. Have it's, a lovely nap. It's that song, but just Rosie's voice editing, edited in saying, doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> My girl doesn't want to party all the time. Um, on this Balmy Wednesday. Um, the film we have decided to cover is a classic, I would say. Bit of a classic, bit of an unknown classic, mm. I would go so far as to say, actually. Um, but we are covering 1980s uh, Peter Madak's The Changeling. <laughs> Um, I've got to say I was pleasantly surprised. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I've, I've heard very little about this film. Um, to start off, we should probably go for a synopsis though, so that it sets the scene. Who's got one? I've got a short one. Yeah, go for it. After the death of his wife and daughter in a car crash, a music professor staying at a long vacant Seattle mansion is dragged into a decades-old mystery by an inexplicable presence in the mansion's attic. Short but sweet. Spooky dudes. <laughs> um, there, there is so much in my notes that just goes, spooky, spooky. <laughs> um, it is, to all intents and purposes, quite a standard ghost story. Mm-hmm. I kind of see this as, like, proto The Conjuring Mm, yeah mm. yeah i could i could absolutely go for that it wouldn't surprise me if it was a massive influence on i think james wan owes a lot to the changeling to be honest and also quickly it struck me while watching we covered the omen recently um mm. like this some of the concurrent themes like this would make such a cracking depressing but cracking double bill with the omen including the excessively aged lead male protagonist compared to his uh his family. <laughs> I will not hear a bad word said about George C. Scott. It's How fine. Do you leave George C. Scott I, alone? <laughs> he's just old. He's just significantly older than his wife. <laughs> Maybe he's just weathered. <laughs> <laughs> he's just been at, staying at cliffs for too long. He's been standing he's... on a boat dock for half of his life. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> Living in lighthouses. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> fighting bears. Sure. He looks like someone who could fight a bear. Um, interestingly, uh, George C. Scott, um, I found it very difficult to find anything else that he'd been in that I recognised him from. Okay. Apart from Dr. Strangelove. Oh, okay, he, yeah, yeah. He was in The Exorcist 3. <laughs> <laughs> he he played Buck in Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Wearing a Love Bomb. Um, but yeah, Exorcist 3, I haven't seen it. Underrated. Underrated, mate. The third of films tend to be um That's a good Halloween yeah. three, for example. Oh, I was wearing my Halloween three hat in town today and somebody complimented me on it. And I just oh. I had a moment where I just stared wistfully after her as she walked away thinking, Who is she? Will she be my friend? I wanna be your friend. Can we start some sort of mutual appreciation club for Tom Atkins I moustache? Can, I can hundred percent imagine how that interaction when which is her coming up to you and going sorry i just i just wanted to say like i love your hat i think halloween 3 is such a great film and like your hat's awesome i love it and you went thanks and then she walked off literally (laughs) 
<laughs> it was so awkward. I was just like, I like you. And you were, I don't know what to do with my nails. <laughs> was, I can see it. Yeah. Because like, that's how we interact in public. <laughs> I've romanticised it a little bit in my head. It was this magical moment with like a missed connection, a friend I could have had. But... Well, some kind of like <laughs> ethereal being came down from the skies and went, Sarah, your hat. <laughs> And then flew away into the mist. It's probably a good job we're not friends, though, because she had a shaved head. So I imagine if I befriended her, I will probably shave my head in about a week's you time. You have that level of impulsivity that yeah. you would just go, Meh. I'd just be like, well, she's carrying it off. Maybe. You know that TikTok audio, which is like, I'm not going to do it. I'm thinking about it, but I'm not going to do it. I did it. Oh, that's just my life. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Um, but yeah, George C. Scott, I don't I mean, he's been like super prolific across yeah. his acting career, but nothing that I recognize. I think Same he was in a Christmas with, Carol. Um, which one? <laughs> the one <Muppets>. that he's in. <laughs> um, same with Melvin Douglas, Carmichael. Yes. Mm. Been in shit loads of stuff. He was super prolific in like the 1930s to the mm. 1940s. In those kind of like um, when cinema, black and white cinema was like in its heyday and they were just churning out like pre 1950s Hollywood films into mm-hmm. the cinemas for fuck all money. Um, he was in basically all of them. He was like um, the Danny Trejo of his time. <laughs> yeah. And, th- and then he quit and opened a donut store. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Did he have um, a cameo in a kids movie from the 1920s? <laughs> <laughs> I, but, but again, just like nothing that I recognise. No. Well, he, I saw him referred to as a veteran actor in some of the trivia and I was like, is he? Who's, who yeah, that? <laughs> he's literally, he like started acting in like, yeah, the 1920s yeah. and was just in everything ever up until about the 1940s 1950s sadly he didn't have a great big role in this one it was pretty mm. important role but quite small but quite short and sweet yeah. yeah but he made a good impact he did yeah i'm not so sure oh, okay. okay oh we'll get to that though because okay. he's, he's only really in like the second half bar one scene in the first half, really. His he is introduced in the first half, yeah. put it that way. But like, and you kind of a lot of this film uh is really obvious exposition. So you're like, <laughs> oh, I wonder who's going to turn up later in the film. Mm. Um, which always happens in a lot of 1980s horror, I think. There's quite a lot of like stuff. Anyway, just, what did I want to say? Just start a with? lot in horror, to be honest. Like Peter Madak. Mm-hmm. Okay. Peter Madak has done some utter guff in his life. <laughs> he has, but it's <laughs> species two. How dare you? Um <laughs> <laughs> Species but, three, um, however. But then he's done <laughs> yeah. some like but then he's done some like really pinpointed awesome stuff. So like uh, I I wrote down a few things. He did quite a few episodes of the Twilight Zone. I was, he worked on that for I quite a while. I was going to say um it seems like he had some film hits earlier in his career. Yeah. A lot of the and film then he stuff went more later. Into TV. On. But the film the the TV stuff that he's worked on is like seminal sort of stuff like Breaking Bad and Carnival, like loads of yeah, my favorite shows. One episode of each. Yeah, that's quite common though. Like they bring people in like um Neil Marshall did a couple of episodes of Game of Thrones and like, you know. And he did one episode of House as well. Um, But does that pay the rent is my question. I don't know. He also did Beverly Hills Cop 3. Is that also the unsung hero of the franchise? (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to say yeah. (laughs) Is it Beverly Hills Cop that has the guy that can do loads of different noises with his mouth? No, that's That's Police Police Academy. Academy. Because my other option was Naked Gun. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I saw Naked Gun two and a half the other day. I forgot to talk about that on the mini said. Well, this always it next was, week. Um, it was great. It was ridiculous. <laughs> he also Rico Palazzo. Peter Madak directed The Craze, mm. which did he? Yeah, which is kind of. I'll be honest. I've never seen it. I know. I know who the Cray twins are. The film, not the twins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, the craze, not the craze as in crazy. No, the craze as in the Cray twins. The Cray brothers. Who my mum lived down the road from. Huh. Does she know them? No. 
she was very scared of them. Does she know uh, Gary Kemp or Martin Kemp? (laughs) (laughs) Or Ross Kemp? (laughs) No relation. Um, But that's thought of quite highly. So he's had a really strange career. Mm. Which the craze? Is it the one with Tom Hardy? No. No. The one before that? It Mm -hmm. was the 1990 one i believe i i don't think it's fair to critically acclaim anything that came out in the 1990s <laughs> what about hackers like me i mean critically acclaimed <laughs> though we all know it's a big pile of shit hack the planet i'll hear nothing <laughs> i'll hear nothing to the detriment of that film mess with the best die like the rest <laughs> just fisher stevens on a skateboard holding on to a car side note is um, what more do you need? Dan and I had a conversation recently about maybe doing like a 90s Doom film fest. Yes! And everybody has to come as, uh, dressed as a character from Hackers. Um, I, but I call um, Matthew Lillard. I'm going to do loads of tiny plats. <laughs> <laughs> and also I'm the Fair. tallest, so. <laughs> okay, in which case I call Johnny Lee Miller because I can just dress normally. I think Dan already <laughs> called Angelina Jolie. <laughs> <laughs> of course you're gonna wear like a white rubber oh i hope not bodysuit i hope not <laughs> i hope so i don't have to go to bed with that man afterwards <laughs> thanks <laughs> that's all right babe um also trish van der veer is that yes. how you pronounce it van der veer I, I that's how i've been pronouncing it in my head um also <laughs> Actually, been in lots of stuff, but nothing I recognise. And she's mm-hmm. married, was married to George was C. Scott married to in George real life. Scott, which is why they were in so many films together. Yeah. Good chemistry, were, man. And that's that really shows throughout the film as yeah. well. Like, some of the more poignant moments between the two of them. There was one moment in uh, particular that I sort of went, ooh, it's a bit of tension. <laughs> ooh, chemistry. Uh, which is when they're at this um, uh, charity fundraising event for the symphony orchestra Mm -hmm. and they're sipping champagne and talking to each other. I'm glad you moved into the house, John. Um, And they look at each other and it's like, oh shit, they're going to fuck. Yeah, like aided by (laughs) quite a lot of innuendo in this movie. I don't know if I'm, maybe I'm broken. But in were, your endo. There was a lot of stuff that I read in a weird way because there was that scene and one of the women was talking about, oh, you've moved into the house. It's so large. And I'm just like, oh, yeah, that's, that's what she I said. That as well. <laughs> it's so large. All right, weird mother. That's what I said. And then like two scenes later when Trish van der Veer turns up in Jodhpur's and she's like, do you ride? <laughs> like, oh, oh, come on. We'll get back to that because I have feelings about that scene. Okay. Um, so <laughs> music um, is something that I think we're going to be touching on quite mm. a lot during this podcast. Definitely. Um, I hope so. It's by Ken Wanberg. Um, Wanberg, what a terrible name. Um, <laughs> it's one of the few films that I have seen in recent memory where I honestly feel like the music informs the film mm. rather than the film informing the soundtrack. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Was trying, I was trying to rack my brain to see if there was any film that utilised music, like horror film, that utilised music in such an integral way uh, as as The Changeling does. Because there are literally still shots mm. Uh, when nothing happens, but there's like a flurry of violin music and it sends a little bit of a shiver through you. Yeah. I... Um, and li- literally nothing happens on screen. There's no mm. jump scare. Mm. There's no anything. It's, but the music informs it. And I think that's really clever. Yeah. And I th- like when it builds to a crescendo, it becomes almost oppressive at times. Yeah. Um, and what literally one of my notes actually is like not to undersell the film itself, but I think the score is like... 90% of what actually makes the film oh, spooky. It's, yeah, it's Without so that, seminal to the scariness of the film. Mm. Ultimately, it's just an old guy walking around an empty house. Uh, do you know what I mean, though? Not a lot happens until the very end of the well, film. Do you, do you know what? I'm inclined to disagree there, actually. Mm. Um, Because this was only a second watch for me. This is mm. one I yeah, arrived same. at quite this late. This is a first watch for me. Yeah, uh, which is kind of fitting that you called it sort of um like a lesser known classic or like a lost classic it is a classic and it gets talked about and referenced quite a lot um 
But for some reason, it just passed me by. And I don't yeah. know how. And up until about three years ago, I'd never seen it. Um, and I heard somebody speaking very highly of it. So I bought it on the off chance. Um, enjoyed it. But for whatever reason, I remembered it being far more of a slow burn than it actually is, which isn't to say it's not a slow burn, but more happens than I remember. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay. I would go as far as to say I'd kind of forgotten everything that happened in the second half. It, like in my memory, Headcanon was like just the first 45 minutes was the film. And so I was surprised right, actually okay. by how much... Um, did happen this is kind of what i mean though the first half of the film is literally like you say a guy walking around an old house <laughs> oh a ball yeah um <laughs> like oh it's oh it's very spooky um oh it's raining and they've just put a there's there are so <laughs> many fucking errors throughout this film <laughs> I, I just want to say that on the off chance i don't know if i um, spotted that many so i'm interested I to spotted hear that at least three okay continuity um, errors or no not continuity errors literally like glaring okay so when he's playing um his lullaby on the piano yeah and he's recording it the camera pans round mm -hmm. behind him mm -hmm. and pans past a mirror in the background oh, right okay where there is a sound boom <laughs> oh no i didn't spot that um, and then there are a couple of bits where, like, the first time he goes into the attic room, he pushes the door aside and a shadow walks out of the shop. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that and, one like, I clocked. There's, just, there's, there's at least, like, three or four bits like that that I was like, ah, come on! I think I remember seeing a shadow being cast from, like, the camera crew on a yeah. some something. Yeah, it's like on a sheet because yeah. it's such stark lighting in the attic. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, like, full-on sound boom in the mirror. <laughs> And I was like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> Nobody noticed that. Really? Oh, bless him. Um, apparently, at one point in the film, uh, Trish, um, who plays Claire Norman, she calls him George instead yes. of John. Yeah, I didn't clock that in the version I had. Well, it's been cut out of some versions, right. according to um, wherever it was that I read it. Because um, I read that before I watched it, so I was trying to oh, listen okay. out for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I checked out quite a bit of like trivia and little bits and pieces beforehand. One thing I did find really interesting, apparently Martin Scorsese says that this is like the scariest film he's ever seen. Yeah. Interesting. What? Well, I, I mean, I mean there, there are bits of it that are... There, no, there are bits of it that are genuinely very uh, chilling. It's difficult though, isn't it? Because Martin Scorsese is old enough to have seen this when it came out and things have and changed so, so much. so desensitised mm. at this point. Yeah, and like maybe even a little bit jaded, cynical, mm. um, certainly yeah, harder like you, to shock. You compare this to something like The Hills Have Eyes. Yeah. And it's like, eh, 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 it's man in the house. <laughs> um, but there, there are some bits which I genuinely found like quite... Um, creepy and it's because oh, yeah. well it's because it's something that i've had a nightmare about oh no, no. it's joseph your sleep paralysis demon <laughs> i think he might be <laughs> um he just upturns his wheelchair and falls on me <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <laughs> well how else is he meant to i don't know i don't know how that works anyway um yeah the bit that really creeped me out um when Joseph is like making himself known to George, mm -hmm. uh, to John even, um, and he starts turning on all the taps. Oh yeah, I've had a nightmare where I've heard running water, gone into a room where a sink's been like filling up, turned off the taps, and then they just turn themselves back on again, and like it's it's the stupidest nightmare in the world. But basically, I've ended up drowning in this room. Oh god, and. As soon as I saw it, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> that... No, no, Joseph, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's tapping into something primal for you then. It it pushed a fucking button, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Jeez. Um, we, I feel like we jumped right into the meat of the film without talking about the first um, scene where John's uh, wife and child perish. Yeah, so my first note... Um, 
I, I feel like I had this same reaction the, the first time I saw the film. I really want to know what your first note is, because my one is interesting. Um, My first note is just all caps, PRINCESS FUCKING MUMBY! <laughs> <laughs> Mine is, oh my god, it's snow! <laughs> Mine is, 27th of November. <laughs> <laughs> and then chase me, chase me. I was, look, I was gonna look up whether uh, the weather an episode release dates fell on that particular date because it would have been cool to have actually released it on the twenty seventh of November. Twenty <laughs> uh, seventh of November this year is a Saturday, I believe. Oh, Gee, it would have been cool if we had released this podcast on the twenty seventh of November. Saying, just, like... just saying, guys. <laughs> um, I know that he couldn't have saved them. Yeah, because he was in a glass case of emotion <laughs> <laughs> but seriously like he just forgot how doors worked at that point i don't know that i would remember in that sort of blind panic though what would you do open it <laughs> <laughs> just open the fucking door i don't know i don't know i i sympathized with him there i think that was i think it was really so that opening scene kind of encompassed a lot of what I love about 70s cinema. And straight off the bat, I realised this came out in 1980. Mm. <laughs> but they filmed it in 78 and 79, and it has mm-hmm. so much more in common with cinema from the 70s than it does cinema from the and 80s. everyone looks very much like oh, yeah. they're in the 70s. Yeah. It's, all, it's always so easy to say, oh, the 70s God, is this, 80s crazy? is this. I've literally just realised Alien came out the year before this. Yes. <laughs> but I, but for that reason I'm going to continue to call this like I'm going to continue to refer to it as a 70s horror movie yeah. um, but it kind of encompasses a lot of what I love about that era and it's like the really wide shots and the slow zooms and the tracking I fucking live for it that wide shot at the beginning reminded me a lot of The Prey okay um, I still haven't seen that I, I think that you genuinely love it because it's um Silly. <laughs> Classic and hilarious. I think there's a bit of both that play really well against each other. Okay. Um, but it's got a lot of uh like gore and horror intercut with just beautiful scenes of nature <laughs> and birds in the trees. I'm all right with that. Um, I love both yeah, of those it's, things. It's, it's, it's great. And like you <laughs> laugh, but you laugh because you're like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> um That's just life, babe. But yeah, that was great. <laughs> I loved that um in that kind of like 70s full exposition way the next scene there is nothing to tell you anything about george uh john um <laughs> apart from the fact john george, george john john george uh <laughs> jean george um there's nothing to Paul. tell you anything about where he is or what he's doing or who he is because you don't know he's a musician you mm-hmm. don't know that he's in wherever he is um the only way you can tell he's a musician is that they have somebody walking past with a double bass <laughs> i mean <laughs> looking really cool and it's show like, don't ah, tell musicians <laughs> show don't tell that, that's good that filmmaking was the, that was the one thing that they had <laughs> Would you have preferred um, a whole brass band marching beside him? <laughs> Mariachi, I think. <laughs> okay. Just him walking, looking very sad, and then... Just, 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 just him doing the Charlie Brown walk. <laughs> oh, he did, down the stairs, let's like, be honest. Yeah. But wouldn't you, if all your family had died? Yeah, that would, you know, understandably make me quite sad. Yeah. I don't think we need to explain that further. <laughs> <laughs> um... As soon as I saw the ball rolling uh, across the room when he's packing all his stuff up, yeah. I was like, "Check out, ah. check out's ball." <laughs> my team, <laughs> my team. We'll if be seeing ball, that roll. again. <laughs> it's quite interesting, yeah. actually, talking about this straight off the back of um, Trick or Treat, because. Obviously, until recently, until we covered that, I had no idea that the gumball rolling down the stairs was an oh, homage neat. to that was moment. It was a bit of an Easter egg. I, That's yeah. very cool. I think, I think probably one of the things about the changing that gives it its um, obscurity, I suppose, is that a lot of the things it does do, it might have done for the first time, but because they're a bit generic. Oh, and we've seen them a lot since. You, but but uh, and you can't say oh that was from the change. It's not like a, a, yeah. a elevator of blood. 
Like that's so specific to The Shining, and anything that does that is the sh- is going to be referenced in The Shining. Uh, <laughs> but already, the Changeling one. doesn't. Re- <laughs> the Changeling doesn't really have any of these moments that are so specific that they are definitely from this movie, you know? So I've literally gone through and highlighted everywhere that a trope has come up. Okay, okay let's hear them. Um, so there haven't been, like... There weren't an awful lot, to be fair, but, like, you know, sort of, like, rainy nights, thunderstorms, um, the trope of a dripping tap waking him up. Mm-hmm. The trope of a door opening by itself. Yeah. The trope of children's laughter. Someone being chased by a wheelchair. Wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> piano playing itself. Yes. Um, yeah. The piano playing itself. Mm. Yeah. There's so many things that, like you say, they might have done them first, mm. but because they've become so generic to us within horror films and cinema, mm. it, it fades into obscurity. Mm. It fades into something that you wouldn't, unless you knew. This sounds dumb, but unless you knew, you wouldn't know. Yeah, that it no, had come from that well, film. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's because they are so generic; they're not like really specific, like the the elevator of blood, you know. So, although like the wheelchair chasing Claire and they're falling down the stairs, like that's pretty. I've seen that before. But I haven't. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty but, fucking. That's pretty. That, them. <laughs> I haven't seen that referenced anywhere, you know. No, true. Um, it's interesting. The like. <laughs> oh, I think I've less... scrubbed that film from my yeah, memory. Yeah, the less said yeah. about that, the better. <laughs> Jumpy, Jum- man. Jumpy can fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I remember from that film is the like crab walking mm. patients, right, maybe yeah, with, with so, the upside down Yeah, heads. so the wheelchair falls down the stairs and then he climbs back up looking all creepy like. Oh, okay. Okay. But he is in the wheelchair at the time. Mm. Was Gary Oldman so. in that? Was it Gary Oldman? Uh, I hope not. <laughs> it was like a really good actor and I just spent the whole time going, You're better than this. What's going on? <laughs> I need to look this there up was, now. There because... was someone really good in it, wasn't yeah. there? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I've also scrubbed it from my memory. <laughs> so he moves to Seattle um, and sees his friends who... I... Right, okay. Here is my rage for the day. Can I just say a nice thing first? Gary Oldman. It was Gary Yes. Why do I doubt my memory so much? I don't up. know. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to... Say a nice thing before you say, say the bad say thing. Say a nice thing. Um, they had a lot of really nice plants. There were a lot of really good plants <laughs> in this film. So many good plants. So many plants. Right. We'll get onto it later. But why the fuck does a seven-year-old have so many nice plants in their room? <laughs> right? I can't keep plants alive. How's the seven-year-old doing it? She's got like twenty plants in a textbook. What a weird <laughs> kid. And a remnants of a well we'll get to that and, and, <laughs> yeah i mean i don't think it's i mean obviously spoilers but you know she's got dead body under her bedroom <laughs> um he the th- ah, i got so <laughs> so raged about the fact that he's telling his friends like about you know when Kathy and her mother died. I was in shock and I didn't really process it. And then it hit me and I was just like saying, oh, they're gone, they're gone, they're gone. But you know, it's been four months, so we need to get my oh, shit together yeah. now. And they're just like, oh yeah. Four months. Aren't you over it yet, you big pansy? Like, yeah, it's what been the over a hundred days. Get your shit together, John. What? I'm I'm not over <laughs> that Carnival got cancelled over a decade ago. <laughs> Jesus Christ, give the man some breathing room to grieve. The Phantom Menace, it's been 18 months and it still hurts. <laughs> Babylon 5's a big pile of shit. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, yeah, no, I just want to be by myself, want to live by myself. And she's like, I know some someone who rents out creepy haunted mansions. <laughs> yeah. Do you want one? I know of a house you definitely shouldn't live in. How about that? That'll help. <laughs> I know some really haunted as shit places. How yeah. about you live there? Oh, You'll see. be alone mostly. <laughs> Sad about your family dying. How about some ghosts? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's that's how he finds the house. Even even fucking looks haunted. Although I would say that it looks haunted when they see it because it's like it's a facade, isn't it? It's not mm. an I actual love, house. I love that shot. There's quite a few shots actually that are filmed sort of quite low down, where he's kind of he looks quite towering in the frame. There's a couple shots. Yeah. One where he's kind of holding the ball for the first time that sticks out in my mind, and also mm. when you're sort of seeing the whole of the house for the first time, it sort of pans up and. 
yeah, I was surprised to learn that that was just like a, fa- like a fascia she... on a a real house. Like mm. that doesn't actually exist. That's crazy. I like that she picks him up to drive up the road to the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can well, I give you a lift? <laughs> it's like just a hundred meters. Yeah, I can see it, love. <laughs> <laughs> It's a big fucking house. And then, yeah, then, then then we get to the the evening gala with it's so large. Oh, um, pr- prior to that, um, we get to see him um, teaching. Oh, mm. no, he doesn't teach. He's just playing the piano. And then he teaches to the college students because he plays the note of duff. Yeah. He's like, buh, 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 duff. Yeah. Duff, duff, duff. And that's when it like the key plays itself. But did you notice that um, the incidental music behind it has like a really discordant yeah. chord that they play behind it as well? I oh, just the music in this is just so good. But it's amazing, and it's mostly I. I mean, it's strings and piano. Mm-hmm. It's it's symphonic, mm. which ties in with his job and Carmichael. Um, putting forward the symphony orchestra in the next scene and like uh, it's just it's really nicely tied together i love that about it apparently george c scott actually did learn that piece of music so he could play it authentically that was what he played to the college students yeah but Mm. well that whole scene kind of sits a bit strange with me um were people more easily amused in the late 70s (laughs) because almost definitely it was just the weird, unintentional, like, what are you here for? Are you doing a set? Is this a roast? <laughs> you do some unintentional stand-up comedy. Everything he said, he was just like, well, you know how I hate making speeches. Ah, lol, lol, lol. Like, what? What's going on? Why and, is everyone and when, um, uproariously laughing at everything he says? <laughs> it's not funny. And when George, uh, John, George, John, John George, John George, does his first uh, lesson to a class of, like, hundreds of students, well, there were only meant to be 23 of you today. <laughs> Yeah, and everyone laughs, and he's like, "Well, clearly, you must all be really bored." <laughs> but that's what I mean. Like, what it, it the tonal tonally, it was so strange. All I will say is that our parents are the exact kind of people who like Mrs. Brown's boys. <laughs> Fair. Fair. <laughs> so yes, people were a lot more easily pleased in the seventies. Do you know that like Mrs. Brown's boys won some sort of award for like best? I, no, I don't, and I don't care to know best comedy <laughs> ever. Not even of the decade, <laughs> ever. <laughs> I love imagine? the way they cut between the piano track and the orchestra playing the same track in the next scene. Oh, I didn't even clock it's that. Very smart. It's like a whole motif that the, goes the, all the yeah, way through. The, the, the scene when he's because that's why he's students. there, yeah. Yeah. presumably. Yeah. He's playing his song um, and kind of he's he kind of builds up to a crescendo. I think on the piano, yeah. cuts to the the orchestra playing the same bit of music in the next scene. It's really oh, neat. Cool. N- and a, a it's nice conducted way of like tying the uh, tying the scenes together. Yeah, and it's conducted by an Asian Deirdre Barlow. <laughs> <laughs> didn't pick up on that. <laughs> Hashtag free Deirdre. <laughs> my favourite character. Actually, no, my favourite line in the entire film comes from this scene because um, John's just like chilling, maxing, mm-hmm. relaxing, being all cool. Chilling like a villain. Chilling like a villain. And um, somebody says something about him. Somebody goes, oh, yes, but he's a natural ham. <laughs> and I'm like, same, babe, same, honestly. Well, I've had so many mean. crisps over lockdown that I'm also a natural ham. <laughs> What does it mean? <laughs> I think for him, they meant that he was being like hammy, like oh. a hammy actor. For me, it meant ham planet. <laughs> <laughs> Too many donuts. That's what it meant for me. I think it no, might have been calling him fat. It might have been you that introduced me to the term ham planet. <laughs> <laughs> Just round and with snacks in orbit. That sounds great. Um, right? <laughs> That's what I aspire to be. I've I've reached my peak physical form, I feel. <laughs> um yeah. So then we've got like the tropes. That's when stuff starts to get really creepy, I guess. Like you've got all of the the dripping tap, which mm-hmm. freaks me the fuck out. Uh and you hear the uh the six a.m. banger clock. 
<laughs> that right can i just say i'd be out i would have noped out of there so fast at that point oh, right that literally like, and he's there like it's clearly so deafening he's there sort of shielding his ears it's that bad why are you still there you absolute madman <laughs> i have never seen somebody be less scared he in did, my like, entire life Right, this is why... He came I, out of the room and went, oh, a bang. This is kind of why I love George C. C. Scott, right? Firstly, he has a really good face. <laughs> Can we he just... Does. We just don't he does acknowledge have a really good the face. fact he's got an excellent face. He's, and I think he'd be wicked to have a drink with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But he just, like... He just seems fucking cool, man. He, like, takes <laughs> everything in his stride. Yeah, this is it. Like, he's just he's just not phased. It's like he's his baseline is sort of several fingers of whiskey deep at all times, <laughs> and he's just like vibing. Yeah, <laughs> I like Pure it. Vibing. He, he's a Pure mood, vibing. as the kids would say. <laughs> he he is a whole ass vibe. <laughs> Love but it. Just he's he's not phased by any of it. Like the taps are all running, and he just goes and like goes, huh. That's yeah. weird. <laughs> just turns them off. <laughs> and he sees like the face of a dead boy in the water and st- takes one step back and goes, I should probably leave this room. It's because it, it's because it was the late 70s. He's a he's a man's man. He ain't face by man. nothing. He didn't cry, he's a man's man. <laughs> um I mean I can't I can't remember what order it came in, but assuming the the 6 a.m. banger clock uh came first. <laughs> would uh, would you? There were two points pretty close to each other, but mm. yeah. Okay, but w- would you guys immediately jump to oh something spooky's happening? Because I think it's I, yeah. I you, but I, I always find it very easy <laughs> to. If it was that loud, okay. I I <laughs> don't think reverberating <laughs> through a mansion. <laughs> yes. Do you know what my first thought would be? It wouldn't be ghosts if I heard if I was awoken rudely awoken to bangs that loud i think house my, invasion no my brain would just go oh, aliens <laughs> oh oh so you're like pipes you're like aliens and i'm like house invasion no i yeah i'm like this is my abduction this is the moment <laughs> if there was a bright light in the window i'd be like take me over the yeah. mobs. let's see if up there's any better probe me all you no, want I don't probing please <laughs> Mate, recently I've had far too many things put up my ass. <laughs> <laughs> For casual now, listeners, can you please expand on that? I was very ill and I it. was... Yes, thank you. I was very ill and I had to be in intensive care and I didn't realise that not only do you get a catheter, you also get a butt catheter. <laughs> so you don't have to... Poop. Go anywhere. I'm glad oh, no, you, you cleared poop. that you up. Them. Yeah, <laughs> go yeah. To well, you literally just told me to clear that up. So, well, I felt like leaving it hanging would. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Bad choice of words. We do- Oh god! <laughs> I was about to say we don't want to leave it open for interpretation. I can't say anything, can I? <laughs> you're disgusting. <laughs> no, you're disgusting. <laughs> no, you. Um, no, you are. Uh, Oh yeah, the do you ride bit. We're at the do you ride bit. So she finds the ball in the bureau, and literally, I've never seen a woman more pleased by a ball in my entire life. I don't know she about that. She holds it up and goes, Ooh. and he's like, "Yeah, that's my dead daughter's." And she's like, "Well, this is fucking awkward. I'm gonna go." And he goes, "Are you riding a horse?" And she, like, where does she get the other horse? <laughs> That's Did a she really bring good a point. Spare? That's yeah. a really good point. But also, stupid question: What else is she dressed for? You put the spare in the boot of the other horse. Oh come <laughs> on! You've seen like American <laughs> suburb mothers wearing jodhpurs all the fucking time. Have I? I? It's a thing, and they wear like is gilets. It? Oh, the gilet crowd can. And um, knee high boots. Off. I didn't know like riding gear was a fashion. Yeah, unfortunately, it definitely is. Oh, man. So that people look at you and go, do you ride? And then they go, (laughs) yeah. In fact, I bought my spare horse with me. Do you want to come along? (laughs) It's it's in the boot of the other horse. (laughs) I didn't even question that. (laughs) (laughs) Just lift up its arse and pull another horse out. (laughs) That's where you keep the spare, don't you? And then when they stop, she's like, are you all right? And he's like, yeah, I'm just thinking about my dead daughter who loved horses. Why did you come? (laughs) 
Jeez, man, it's been over four months at this point, aren't you? Over it yet? It's been 120 days, for fuck's sake. You've got ghosts to contend with now. Are you still thinking about those guys? Come on. And I think it really enrages him because in the next scene, he's got some college students around playing his piece with him and he stops and he's like, we were a bit slow on some bits and darling, you're awful. <laughs> I mean, Apart from that, it was great. His baseline is just mildly pissed, which <laughs> explains so much of his behaviour. Mm -hmm. If you watch the film from the point of view of he has like a tiny hidden IV line of whiskey <laughs> at any point going into his system, yeah, I it mean, makes a lot more sense. He's a musician, of course he is. <laughs> That's true. Tortured musician, grieving yeah, musician, exactly. in fact. A grieving musician who smokes heavily. Like, if he didn't drink, I would called bullshit like the, you get to that level and the whiskey just spontaneously appears around him <laughs> his glass just refills <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know how in cartoons when people are really sad they have like a gray cloud that rains just on them is it like this is just whiskey, whiskey rain <laughs> yeah and every so often he just goes am 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 yes <laughs> you've nailed it nailed it <laughs> I think every time, because there are so many slow pans, every time the camera is not on him, he's just like doing a shot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In every scene, there's an empty shot glass just knocked over on the table where he's going, shit. <laughs> it was a, it was a, a, a ghost. Uh... <laughs> yeah. there, there, there's a ghost. There's, there's an alcoholic ghost in the house who keeps drinking all my whiskey. Joseph, did it's you drink very, all the whiskey? It's very distinguished. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the next scene, he basically just gets called crazy as well, which I love. He's like, there's a ghost in the house and I'm a drunk musician. And they go, <laughs> are you sure you're not mad? <laughs> you're right, love. Are you um, sure? You need a break, baby. Can we talk about um, the not the horrible lady? That Trish Who Vanderveer's is in character. The scene? Yeah, Huxley. well, that's Lee. Mini I Huxley. That's I her name. I hate her. She's got a face like a bulldog licking piss off a stinging nettle. Yeah. She Ew. looks like she's trying to hold a bumblebee in her mouth at all times. <laughs> yeah. A really angry bumblebee. Yeah. It's livid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the bees. <laughs> um. She, uh, yeah, she's horrible. And she's like, that house is not fit to live in. Like you can, <laughs> you can still be polite, you rude bitch. She looks like uh, her character should have a small cloud of green smoke around her at all times. <laughs> yeah, like Just she like... is a pantomime villain. <laughs> yeah, literally, she's she's a trope in herself. She's one of the tropes. Like the the cantankerous old lady who goes beware the yeah. haunted house. Like the naysayer who knows more than they're letting on. Like that Literally, in itself is a trope. He goes, then there has been trouble in the house, and she's like, peace, and just yeah. fucks off. <laughs> Literally just pieces Straight out of up. there. <laughs> just notes out the Vengie. <laughs> <laughs> just ousts herself from the room. No, like there's no alarm on her face or anything. It's not even like, oh, I've said too much. It's just like, oh, bye. <laughs> it's so weird. Oh, so weird shit has happened here. So you <laughs> <laughs> No, come back. No. I know she serves a purpose, but I think she was my least favourite character. Mm -hmm. She serves a shit purpose. She I was horrid. Punch her. <laughs> um what's next? Ooh, red glass. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh a window smashes mm -hmm. when he's outside. Convenient. <laughs> um red glass from the only red window in the house, also convenient. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes to explore right and if right if i was the only person living in a house and i went outside and a window broke from the inside out i'd be like calling the police not fucking going in there yeah i would be a little bit more alarmed than he was alarmed that's a good way of putting it definitely alarmed yeah um, but he just goes no i'm gonna go and play the three door game <laughs> So he goes upstairs, he looks in door number one, no spooks. <laughs> he looks in door number two, no spooks. And then he goes, oh, wait. What is behind door number three? <laughs> Secret there door are number potential three. spooks <laughs> behind this shelving unit. And then the 6am bang start again when he's hitting the 
Uh, it's like a repeating motif. He's hitting. He finds a door with a padlock on it, and he's hitting it, and it's like mm. the six a.m. bangs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which they the plumber describes as like almost rhythmic. Or mm-hmm. no, he describes two plumbers. He describes, plumber as, like, he describes rhythmic. as rhythmic, yeah. and the plumber's like, um, <gasps> that's just pipes, isn't it? Well, he said <sighs> he said like furnaces are like anything else; they have habits, mm. which they... I thought was a really weird thing to say because no, they don't. This one's a smoker. <laughs> <laughs> this one's a crackhead. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like it's not like at six o'clock every. I've never known a, a like plumbing system at six o'clock every morning to go wake and wake him up, fuckers. <laughs> yeah, it's not a rooster, for fuck's sake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like just ah. Um, I feel like the scene where he's um where he's gone behind door number three and he's gone ah. <laughs> False, the spooky doll. false wall kind of thing, mm-hmm. and he's like pulling the shelves out. That's kind of a trope as well. Yeah, finding a secret hidden locked yeah. door. I don't know if I'd seen that very much before this film. It's I've seen it a know, lot after. It? Mm. It's hard to know whether it is like this was the film that originated these tropes. Yeah. Or... Well, this right. I was trying to think, and it's on. really difficult to do the research to find mm. out what came first as well. Because I mean, what do you uh, Google? Like, who found a spooky door first? <laughs> well, I'm trying. I was trying to think of like prominent haunted house movies that came before this one obviously the haunting yes um the original house on haunted hill house on haunted hill which um, is just hilarious like with the plastic skeletons pushing people (laughs) oh you gotta love a bit of william castle though Mm -hmm. they're just putting a skeleton on a skateboard and pushing it across (laughs) the scene it's not it has a place i love it it, but it's not nah i know i was just about to say you're a fan of the innocence would you count that yeah, that's gone that's ghosts. A, yeah, well, it, interestingly, um, uh, thirty I did, ghosts. No, before oh, the original. Um, was that in a house though? I don't know. I just I know the remake. Really? Are you seen googling to... the question? No, I'm googling whether the original was. We've had words about this. Type in. Look on your phone. Fine. It's too noisy. Fine. Nobody wants to hear your clickety clacking. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there's something in the trivia about uh, Alejandro. Um, and Minabar, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, Alejandro Minabar. <laughs> um, having like claimed, that name. It's a good name, right? It's Alejandro. Fancy. Um, but apparently he's claimed that this is one of his favourite movies. And thinking about it, I hadn't seen Thesis until maybe a year ago. Fantastic film. Really good film. Um, I haven't noticed any what connections. What did he do? He did The Others. The others. That's it. Which, the one with Nicole Kidman. Mm-hmm. I mean, if that doesn't owe so much to the innocence i don't know what does right yeah. mm-hmm. so i think there there are sort of fingerprints of films like this throughout um filmmaking like mm. it's it it's very like those, difficult to know what influenced what those tropes have always been there but it's what you do with them that yeah. makes them good or not or memorable or believable yeah. or not or memorable yeah mm. and and actually uh, Saying memorable, I don't think is necessarily very fair because we've been talking about how unmemorable this film is because of its tropes. But actually, I don't know if I they agree do with it that, very, though. very well. I don't know if I agree with that. I think, um, but if somebody said you name a horror film with a tap dripping, would you automatically oh, yeah, say that's... the Changeling? No, I wouldn't. That's kind of my point. Or a spooky like, ball. Yeah, or a spooky ball rolling down the stairs, or tap like, stripping. Uh... I don't know. My brain goes to like J horror more than anything. Or like children laughing Ugh. or running down a corridor kind of thing. None yeah. of those would make me go, oh, the changeling, obviously. Mm-hmm. That's fair. I think the scene, um, which I would like to talk about, mm. um, the scene with the medium, I guess. Yeah, it comes weird pretty soon after because he finds the music box and he realises that the music box is playing mm. exactly the same music uh, that he's just created. Composed, Well, yeah. I say yeah. that he's just created, <laughs> that he's heard on an advert and has decided it's his. <laughs> yes. Um, and that's when he... They do loads of like research at that point, don't they? Mm-hmm. Because he's like, no, something fucky's going on. And that's when they get a... They do one of those things that I love in old-fashioned horror movies where they go and look at microfiche. I love it. Do you know what? I fucking (laughs) love microfiche because they're still used today. Right? Because it doesn't degrade, does it? No, no, they are still used. Uh, My 
when my dad worked for the company that he works for, because it's a family, his school of family history, all of the like births, marriages and deaths records are all kept on microfiche. So they've got like a whole bank of microfiche machines with all of these like records on them. I do um, understand the drive to digitize everything, but there's something magical about I mean, that it's, stuff. It's, oh, yeah. It just looks really cool. I used to be in love with them when I was younger as well. And I've just, never like, used one. The, I mean, literally, it's like a... You know those um, things that you put up to your eyes and you click the button mm-hmm. and it spins yeah, around to the like next picture? Yeah, like a Viewmaster. A Viewmaster, but it's massive screen. Yeah. And you put the little, like, doop in <laughs> and then you turn a wheel and it just scrolls through this, oh, like, so tape. Cool. It's really cool. And it's a really clever bit of technology. And I don't know yeah. why it's not still, <laughs> like, mainstream, actually, because you can... I guess when everything's digitized, you can literally put it down to like a, a cell's worth of space. But and then you, you get you my get fish were search. tiny. I feel like and this is it. Searching's a lot quicker rather than having to scroll well, through everything. But it's just yes it's, and no. It depends. It depends on the specificity. Like if you're looking for something reasonably vague and you've got a time frame, I would say it's harder to find on the internet because of the absolutely. wealth of information. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. The um, I don't know if I know that in America, a lot of newspapers, for example, like they go and look through or on microfiche. I don't know if that's the same in the UK. Oh, it's just so cool. <laughs> um, but like it, all the random stuff that you can find out through these tiny little reels is, yeah. is amazing. Like I, I've got such a soft spot for microfiche. I think they're really awesome. Like I realize. In, in something like this, it wasn't sort of a stylistic choice. That was mm-hmm. what they had. That was what they had, yeah, but absolutely. It's still and like so at one cool. point, they're just looking through like massive books. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's just, yeah. it's just so evocative of a time period, isn't it? It is. It really is. And I think, I think even, even in modern day, if you see one of those in, in a modern day movie, you know that what they're looking up is is old, right? It's yeah. like 70s, 80s, yeah. pre that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because uh, from... This is my nerdiness coming out. Uh, the first word processor was released to the public in 1982. Okay. Okay. Same. So, I was also um, released to the public in 1982. <laughs> well, like, it was the... <laughs> I want to say the first one was an Amstrad, although I think the first one was actually like uh, Spectrum ZX, uh, but made with a word processing bit of software. Okay um so it was like becoming more mainstream in the very early 80s but still a couple of years after this okay so there are no computers in this film but if you watched a film from like three years later there probably would be okay i just i find it really interesting because obviously i've talked about the conjuring a little bit at the start and how much i think the conjuring universe owes to films like the changeling Mm. Mm. yeah I feel like in films like that, it's a really cool way to date your movie without having to sort of say, this is set in 1970-whatever. It's that um, it's that really interesting uh, time setting that is the polar opposite of things like It Follows, where they have deliberate yeah. anachronisms. <laughs> yeah, like this would quite... I, if I saw microfiche, I would assume probably 70s, to be honest. Mm, mm. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, and the way they're dressed as well, I would assume. 70s. Oh yeah, definitely. Like there's 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 a lot of stuff. The lack of mobile phones, Everyone's the lack so of well televisions, out. and like if this was if this was now, if this was me, and I'd woken up to banging, I'd have been stumbling around in my pajamas. That everyone's yeah. so well turned out in the seventies. Everyone's so presentable. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Um. But yeah, like it's it's that point they throw in. I it's really interesting that they throw in such a red herring. I think with this film, because when he goes into the attic, the notebook that he picks up says C S B on it. Yeah, and they're like convinced for a good sort of few scenes that the attic was Cora's bedroom, the mm. daughter of. Uh, Dr. Bernard or whoever it was. Mm-hmm. And they're like absolutely convinced that that's whose bedroom it was. And it's only when we go onto the scene that you want to talk about that you sort of realise that it, it's not. But they, they keep it going and it's a bit of a, it's a red herring, but I don't know why. Why? Yeah. I don't know why they put it in. 
I don't know because not a huge amount of information have been released at that point to, to yeah. the viewer like we don't really know what what's going on which it, again I so kind of love about this film because it's as much of a mystery thriller as it is a ghost story as well mm. I kind of enjoy yeah, that element. it is it definitely is and it's really good um I've actually got a note saying that like he's basically fucking um Cluzo. do you know what I mean <laughs> like he just at the end he kind of goes oh I believe it is this and I believe it is this for this reason and oh I am Poirot I'm going to twirl my moustache <laughs> and I have solved the riddle and the mystery um, and I love that like it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a murder mystery set yeah. in a haunted house mm. yeah that's really cool what an idea for a film absolutely I think um, I guess with that red herring I think they either should have gone harder into that or taken out entirely. left it out yeah, yeah. yeah. it just yeah. seems really insipid the one that ju- the one that jumped out a film that does that is is the ring because and that that um has an emotional narrative purpose because it's it's deliberately misleading you down a path that you think is heading towards a resolution and it turns right. out that's completely wrong yeah. whereas whereas this it's like oh it's not like there's no emotional involvement with Cora like there's just oh it's this girl oh no it's not this girl and well they find they find what two newspaper clippings one of them says Cora got hit by coal truck the next one says Cora died and they're like oh my god poor Cora that's the girl that's in the room mm. and then like the next scene he sees a parapsychologist who goes time to call the plumber <laughs> um don't make a drainiac joke <laughs> it's too don't, late I've already don't do done it. it I've already <laughs> done it um and then they get a medium to come in hmm. um and that's the only bit you hear about cora really they like go to visit yeah. the grave and they go oh poor cora and i just it seems so set aside from the rest of the story i'm not i i, I just didn't really know why they put it in hmm. unless it was for us to go ah cora oh not cora oh yeah maybe it was just supposed to be like a very just brief trying to be a bit red smart. herring or I don't know. I'd be interested to know if there was more that kind of hit the editing room floor. Mm. Mm. Maybe. I'm sure there was. Um, yeah, yeah. The medium. Mm. You have things to say. Well, no. I just think it's a really cool scene in terms of like it's a very cool scene in terms of um, what we were sort of saying about not a great deal of it being specific to this movie or memorable or iconic. I think that. This is one of those exceptions. I think it's yeah. been done a lot since. I don't remember anything like this having mm. been done before it. I mean, you what can the... definitely see the influence of um, the others. Yeah. Sorry, Rosie. Hugely. Not, I was going to say, what the fuck was like the Roman candle in the middle of the table all about? Like that metal... <laughs> what? She's I don't asking know. questions to a metal pole. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't know. I don't have any answers for that. I sort of took it to be some sort of divination thing. Like, I don't know. Something, There's a like, shadow in the shot in this uh, oh scene no. as well. <laughs> <laughs> Can we not write those off as like them being ghost. just extra spoopy? Spooky <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I, this I house like is the haunted fact... by a film By boom crew. mics. <laughs> <laughs> Who tragically died in this house 15 years ago. Can you imagine if that had happened on the Truman Show? <laughs> um, but yeah, they turn up and just like, the wife just fucks off. Yeah. Did you not know? She just like, she just went, see ya, and just went Whoops. up the stairs all the way to the attic, opened up the door and went, oh, no, 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 no. And just shut it. <laughs> Which is a totally human and normal reaction. If I opened the door and looked up into the attic, I'd be like, you could fuck right (laughs) off and I would have gone back downstairs. And honestly, her just being in somebody else's house and nipping off to the attic because she didn't know what else to do is honestly kind of on a par with my social skills at the moment. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) They they weren't even like, she's going to go and have a bit of a look around and see if she can find any (laughs) ghosts. He was he was just like, no, if you can sit in here and turn all the lights off and then I assume at some point my wife will return from going around your house. I sort of appreciate the no-nonsense approach. They're there for a purpose. They're not going to have a cup of tea first. They're like, Olive, no, no, I'm running a sale. Straight to the ghosts. <laughs> 
uh, the <laughs> wife. Uh, I mean, she's one of my favorite characters in the film. I think. Yeah. Um, just the way that she manages to look like she's entranced. Yeah. Surprisingly um, good at that. I think it's surprisingly difficult to do mm. as well to just look like completely disconnected from the world. Yeah. I realise that that's how I look most of the time, <laughs> but to do it intentionally is actually quite hard. And unmedicated. Give yeah. it the Oscar. <laughs> yeah, fucking hell. Um, and I mean that that shot where the glass smashes. Mm. Is, oh, that was beautiful. That's iconic. I mean, yeah. I would say out of everything in the film, that's the iconic moment. Like I that love a bit slow, of slow motion mo. of the everything in the film was considered <laughs> for slow motion. Um, j- but yeah, just the bit where the glass smashes and like yeah. it, it seemed like the reaction. I get the feeling that nobody in that room knew that was going to happen apart from the director and he was mm. doing the props. Yeah, it did seem pretty authentic, didn't it? Because the reaction from the women, especially, was like. <gasps> Like a scream, a proper <laughs> yeah. scream. They freak the fuck out. Yeah. And I find, I mean, either they're incredible actresses, which I'm not saying they're not, or mm-hmm. that was a very authentic reaction to something they weren't expecting to happen. That's, That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I, I'm inclined to, yeah, I'm inclined to come down on the side of that being kind of organic shock. Because you get that a lot in films, don't you? Like um, things where you want a really natural reaction. So you just don't tell the cast what's happening oh, and God, then yes. see what mm. you get out of mm. it. Some directors like torture their casts. Ah, absolute fuckers, it's horrendous. Yeah. Kubrick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh. oh, are you surprised? Or <laughs> um, And he catches EMP. How exciting is that? He gets EMP mm. on his recorder and I, I was like, it's a remix because he keeps rewinding. <laughs> <laughs> it's re- it's re- it's re- it's re- <laughs> I made myself laugh so hard because he kept on rewinding it and I was like Ooh, zzz, zzz. <laughs> and then Sorry. you've just got the Joseph it's creepy my father my metal my metal father <laughs> he's such a whingy kid I'm not surprised he got drowned <laughs> We at Radio Corpress do not endorse drowning your children, <laughs> even think... if they're brats. <laughs> um, actually, the scene, I mean, you see... Uh, the next scene you see his father, like the, S- Senator Carmichael's father, mm-hmm. it turns out, mm-hmm. um, drowning Joseph. Apparently they filmed that last... It's really kind of harrowing. Yeah, it's not a pleasant watch for sure. No, because again, like, have you ever had anybody hold you by the feet and pull up? Well, I mean, he's got the added complication that he's somewhat paralyzed. Mm. Yeah. So he's e- fucked. Even as a fully mobile person, yeah. if you no, grab I... somebody's feet in the bath and you pull up, that's it. You can't, yeah. you can't get out of that. This is why I work out so much. My core strength. <laughs> but even then, if it's a full bath, if it's a full bath and they pull up your feet, you're fucked. I know. So to do that to a kid who's basically paralyzed as well, it's like double fucked. Mega evil. Yeah. Mm. I think and ultimately this is just a really wholesome film of a dead ghost boy trying to get George C. Scott to have a bath, just engage in some <gasps> self care. <laughs> <laughs> just because he s- smells pretty bad yeah well he's drunk all the time i yeah. find it interesting actually that there's no bath scene in this entire film mm. it would it, it makes sense to me that there would have been some kind of bathing incident with him in the yeah, bath like and foreshadowing. Then, yeah maybe they deemed that too obvious maybe with some of the other fucking exposition in this film really all right (laughs) (laughs) maybe george c scott has a no nudity clause in his contract i don't know Uh, yeah let's go with that i mean he looks like a man that doesn't get naked he looks like a never he's a never nude yeah (laughs) (laughs) he's just got he's just got some jean shorts underneath his trousers yeah um yeah i mean a lot do you know what a lot of what happens next is what I would call pure exposition. It's basically mm. people talking about what has happened and what is going to happen next. Okay. It was the only bit in the film that I found a little bit boring. 
That's interesting. Um, okay. Because they talk about, because you've got Miss Huxley calling Carmichael and it turns out that she's in on it and she knows that oh, Senator who, Carmichael who is knew? actually an orphan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly my point. She hid um, her intentions so well. <laughs> you find out that there was an orphan from Sacred Heart that got taken on and sent to Europe. You find out that Richard is the senator's father. They substituted a six-year-old orphan for Joseph. Um, you find out that the ranch... For some reason, John goes, I'm going to see if they've got a ranch. <laughs> just out of fucking nowhere, I bet they've got a ranch. So just out of um, left field, perhaps... Very quickly, yeah. did either of you know what a changeling was in mm -hmm. this context? Was that not a huge spoiler then? So, I, I didn't. I knew, in like my I, mind, a changeling is like oh, like a the fairy in the and, forest and yeah. gets switched out for a, a fairy. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's how I see a changeling. Which I guess is like the truest or most common definition. But I Certainly think if the you... oldest, I'd say. Mm. Yeah. But in the context of this film, I feel like if I'd known exactly what it was, that the title itself would have been a huge spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't yeah. necessarily well, something I, mean, I the... thought about until this viewing. Well, on the front of the DVD cover, they go, how did you die, Joseph? Why are you in this house? Why do you <laughs> remain? And then they've got a wheelchair. It basically tells you <laughs> the entire story on the front of the DVD cover. <laughs> Oh, it's like DVD menus that have spoilers on. I blind bought this, you <laughs> bastards! <laughs> How dare you? Um, so you find all this stuff out. You find out that, yes, they did have a ranch, like, magically, because he, imag he just felt like they did. There's a location <laughs> of a well, and then they mm. find out where this woman lives, and John becomes, like, fucking Columbo or some shit, and basically says, can I destroy the fuck out of your house? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I'll think about it. Yeah. <laughs> give me give me an evening really? to stew on I'll it. I'll think about it because my daughter had a nightmare. Cool. I mean So again, I don't have children, but if your child came to you very distressed. Yeah. Detailing what they see. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, that would spook the fuck out of you, right? Yeah, but not to the point where I'd like cut up the floorboards. No, probably not. Not after, like, if it happened twice, you'd just be like, all right, nightmares. Cool. Yeah. I might take him to therapy. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like that was a bit more taboo back then. But, uh, I mean, that child honestly needed some kind of assistance. Like, all the plants in the textbook and nothing else. <laughs> all the plants. Very well kept plants, but yeah, they're basically like cut it open, boys. She seems like she's some sort of plant savant. She's doing so well, right? <laughs> um, good for her. <laughs> <laughs> they can't open the floor. The most animated that I've ever seen, George C. Scott, is the point where he goes, "It's a hand." <laughs> <laughs> he finds a bony hand, and he's like, "Holy shit, guys! Check this out!" And he's so, he's so excited. That effect, though, with the medal. <gasps> oh, creepy as fuck, right? I know. Fuck. Sort of viewed through modern eyes, it's so obvious. I know. How they've achieved it. But I still think it's really cool. It's really neat. And I did write down, I guess at this point, anything goes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like, I get, like, it's spooky, but, like, he's not phased by it. He just looks down <laughs> and he's like, oh, a medal's working its way out of the fucking ground. But cool, to be honest. Where's my next drink? <laughs> yeah, the amount of other shit that's been happening. Like, I get the feeling that this isn't actually a film. It's just a John Russell fever dream. <laughs> None of this actually happens. It's a right. bit like Dynasty. He wakes up in the shower. Interestingly, that's very interesting to me that you say that because that was going to mm. be one of my questions that I asked you guys at the end. Mm -hmm. What, did it really happen? Well, no, I think it really happened. But on my first viewing of this, um, because it was re still relatively recent, I remember mm. watching it and up until probably the end, I was kind of semi-convinced that it was all going to be an allegory for grief that it was mm. all to do with like yeah. and and it, 
I, I was reminded I mean, of that on this is. one. Well, in a way, yeah. But I, I wondered it's, it's if very that had occurred. Nose, though. Yeah, I wondered if anybody else had kind of had that feeling as well. Honestly, no. Okay. Um, I found it interesting that the medium said that the boy was connecting to John through his grief. Yeah. Well, it's um, clearly a which huge is the, plot Which point. is the on-the-nose on bit, I guess. Yeah. Um, but there's no real reason for the two to link together because, I mean, he didn't murder his kid and his wife. No. It is a general sense of losing your family or being lost. Maybe that's more it, actually. It's a sense of being lost rather than having lost someone. Mm. Okay. Sort of feeling adrift, you mean? like? Yeah, because he's very adrift. And, you mm. know, John moves to Seattle because he doesn't really know what else to do with himself. Mm -hmm. And his friends bring him over and find him a job and find him somewhere to live. And they they settle him. He doesn't settle him. So he's still very much adrift emotionally where he is. Really? Um, it's been four months. <laughs> it's, been, it's been 120 days. Um, but I think maybe that's more of the... Um, what's the word I want to use? That's more of the sort of motif going mm. through the film. The idea of being lost rather than having lost someone. Yeah, like mm. I didn't necessarily think it was literal because obviously other people become involved and in, entangled in this. Yeah. And it would have been kind of a ham fisted metaphor at that point. But yeah, yeah that was, it was definitely something that occurred to me on first watch. But that I think was really that's interesting. I think perhaps that's more um, influenced by more modern films because it's more common perhaps to have films that are allegorical. <laughs> yeah. Um, Particularly in the world of like A24 horror and stuff like that. Yeah, people don't really like films that are so like, <laughs> Literal. we're going to talk about being sad. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to yeah. say much the same thing. Obviously, those sort of films do use their stories to explore emotions. However, mm -hmm. it doesn't take away from the actual fact that the events are happening. Okay. So, yeah. you know, it. it basically what rosie said you know it's 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 <laughs> that's what that's the theme is exploring even though the events that's the way i took it is the events are happening mm -hmm. but it's what not I like find it's, interesting, it's not like something like babadook which is no you know yeah an allegory right mm -hmm. yeah what i find interesting is that um the way in which joseph manifests himself seems to be quite sinister I don't like know. I even, feel like I feel like even the... though it's meant to be, I feel like it was meant to be that it portrayed as this kind of like cheeky child, like trying to connect with John. But I just found it really quite sinister. I feel like in the first half it's supposed to be sinister, and then when they figure out who, like the fact that it is Joseph who's haunting but then, the like, property, the ball rolling down the stairs, and he goes and chucks one of his most treasured possessions into a river comes back and it falls down the stairs again is that <laughs> is that like context though like if the kid wanted to play yeah that could just be playful rather than like sinister i guess i guess yeah i guess actually like my view is informed by the fact that they're doing movie. something that i've seen in a nightmare yeah right yeah. Too, yeah and yeah. therefore everything has a sinister view to it i suppose i would say actually jumping off from that point um that's probably one of the few complaints that i have about this film Mm. Which is, um, it's less of a complaint when viewed as a murder mystery, mm. um, but it's a complaint when viewed as a straight horror film. I think from the midpoint on, the minute you find out that it is this dead boy Joseph, it sort of punctures a lot of the tension. For me, yeah. at least. I, I, I find from this particular point on, the, the point at which... Um... The point at which John confronts Carmichael and says, I found this medal, and Carmichael fucks off um, and then comes back again. Like, oh, I is just that when he's it. getting on the plane? Yeah. Yeah. I find from that point on, it all becomes very, not messy so much, but very much like, and now we have to tie up all the yeah, loose ends yeah, in order to that. explain the film. Yeah. 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 Rather Agreed. than actually having any kind of... Um, concerted storyline behind it yeah it's very much like 
Uh, well, I guess, um, uh, I guess they can have a fight, and I guess, um, the wheelchair can chase her, <laughs> and I suppose then the house can set on fire. Oh, for a second though, can we talk about how fucking cool it is? I mean, it's when beautiful. The, the um, oh, what you call it? The stairs, the um, Bannister. handrail. The banister is just lighting on fire. Oh my god, yeah. so cool! All the way down, yeah, super cool. <laughs> that, it's really, really that, cool. I've got that down in my notes. Is that shot when the camera's like angled down, was looking up the stairs, the staircase is alight, yeah, and uh, and uh, Carmichael is like trudging up the stairs. It's just oh, that's right, okay. so cool. Here's my issue with that though. <laughs> Carmichael, uh, he's, he's in two places at once. Mm-hmm. Well, they kind Free of ghost. They somewhat touch on that with the ball, don't they? Sort of like this metaphysical sense of like um not astral projection, but like I can't remember what they refer to it as. It's like um, a spirit, isn't it? Yeah. So, so I didn't have so it, much of an issue with that. So is it that it is a kind of astral projection? Because at the time where he's walking up the stairs to go towards the attic, his physical form is like attached to his desk, looking at a portrait of his father with Joseph's medal hanging off it. Yeah, I kind of see him kind of walking up the staircase as more symbolic than anything else. More kind of an astral projection. But then John's looking at it and he's like... you're right, mate. Yeah, he sees him for sure, but he's drunk, so who knows? <laughs> <laughs> he, he could be seeing anything. Yeah. Um, all I could think while I was watching that is the Historical Preservation Society are going to be pissed. <laughs> well, all... they didn't. They didn't seem to much care for that property, did they? <laughs> In all honesty, Nobody that's, should live there. That's the true horror of this film: is that house <laughs> burning down. Right? Yeah. Oh man, I would have been destruction so destruction of a beautiful all of that, home. All of that architraving <laughs> gone. <laughs> mm. It hurts. It hurts even, me deep. Even the interiors. Um, much of it was a set that they built. Yeah. They purpose yeah. built. That's so cool. Oh, it's absolutely like beautiful set work. Mm. Um, I know I know people who have done set work for decades, and I can't imagine them ever creating anything quite as mm. incredible and massive as that. There wasn't, I like I read that in the trivia prior to watching this the second time, and there still wasn't a moment in my head where I saw this as anything other than a real property. Mm. Mm. That's how yeah. good it was. Yeah, there there was no there was nothing that seemed out of place. Mm, none of it looked remotely fake to me. No, not at all. Um, and I and I guess from that point that that's kind of the end of the film. Like I mm. I do, the, I don't really see that there's a massive um, resolution because obviously Carmichael perishes. Yes. Um, both his spiritual form and his physical form. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you sort of um, get the impression that he's kind of maybe having some sort of cardiac incident or but his head's covered over when they bring him out of the room so he did yeah yeah oh yeah very much so um but like cool okay so <laughs> what now yeah there it wasn't a very satisfying resolution because mm. this guy i mean cuz so... cuz presumably carmichael has his own will which is giving money to x amount of people who were going to use mm. it for nefarious purposes um but it's not all going to go to like charity or to a dead kid yeah and in some respects you can kind of view senator carmichael as like a victim as well because he was well he didn't know did he kept well, in the i mean dark. he knew but yeah but his origins were kind of a mystery to him he didn't know um that his father was this evil piece of shit who murdered his own son and like his whole um identity was called into question at the nth hour right okay it's interesting did he not know that i got the impression that it came as a shock to him yeah i got the impression that he knew it and he was keeping it a secret okay which what is makes why you say that? for uh Minnie huxley calling him up and saying that right. john's looking into the history of the house um for the fact that he got onto the plane and he looked at his medal and then put okay. it away again. Like, I think there are certain points which show that he's like, he's scared of being found out. He's very quick. Because to... when you're six years old, you remember what happens to you. So he yeah. remembers being an orphan and then being taken to Europe and then coming back and having a new name and a new life. Yeah, fair, which is fair enough. And obviously, he knew that the house had a history in 
quotation marks. I don't know. I I feel like he knew. I feel like he okay. knew and he was trying to hide it. Okay. So you, he, you think he sort of co-signed his dad's horrible behaviour? Yes, I think he was an asshole. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. Because he is quick to... A write off um, John's story, and B, but yeah. he, he, I mean, he, him. yeah, he cries about like how dare you say this about my father, and then within like a split second, John's walking out, and he goes, "If you ever breathe a word of this to anybody, right, okay, I'll make your life not worth living." And it, it is funny how quick he is to assume it's a bribery attempt, mm. as if it may have happened, as before. if it's happened before. So the previous okay. people who have lived there, like. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. But it, I mean, you end with a child wheelchair and the music <laughs> box opening by itself, and it's like, ah, oh, everything is good with the world. <laughs> Joseph, Joseph's back to being a cheeky scamp who just wants to hear his favorite song, little rap scallion. <laughs> but maybe it's actually um, just a love story, and Claire and John are gonna. Trapes off into Bone. the sunset together and go horse riding with their spare horses. Oh, okay. We have very different views of what romance is. <laughs> <laughs> well, that wasn't without sarcasm. <laughs> She's going to get her spare horse out of her other horse. <laughs> yeah. And they're going to go for a ride into the sunset. Yes. Absolutely. Once, once he's recovered. I mean, to like summarize how I feel about it, I was, like I said at the beginning, I was really pleasantly surprised by it. I think I was pleasantly surprised by it because I'm not often one that goes for haunted house movies. It's not generally the kind of thing I enjoy. But because it was like a haunted house murder mystery, yeah, I really got into it. And I, I thought it was very, um, even though it was a bit on the nose and the exposition was a bit obvious, like... It was comfortable and enjoyable to watch. I, yeah, um, I, with its I, like spooky moments punctuating it. I agree that the murder mystery element definitely elevates it a little bit. Yeah. 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 What What did you think, Phil? Because I know that yeah. you're a massive fan of like haunted house movies. Anyway, this so. is your jam. Well, yeah, this, yeah, this should be this your jam. Anyway, should <laughs> be my jam. Yeah, but I. I... <sighs> As much as I can appreciate how influential this is and how many films have used this as a springboard, I I just can't get over how slow this movie feels at times. Um, I oh, I massively disagree with that. This zipped along for me on second viewing. Really? Yeah. I didn't find it <laughs> difficult to watch, considering it's it's an hour and a half. Um yeah, like I didn't have a problem just sitting and like watching it through all the way. And you know that I have issues with watching. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm um, going to sort of land somewhere between that and say, actually, it feels longer than a, an hour and a half. I think mm. it is a little th- longer than an hour and a half. It's like an hour and 40, 40 or something. Or something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so not significantly so. But this is this kind of what echoes what i was saying in the first half of the show in that i was surprised to read so many people describe it as such a slow burn because actually it like enough happens um i'm not saying it isn't a slow burn it Mm. definitely is definitely like particularly considering today's standards i think maybe people are too used to watching marvel films for example which are like bosh 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 punch 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 dun 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 yeah uh, or watching horror films which come out today which either are deliberately a very slow burn or tend to be quite quick and zippy. I just love the 70s. This is my <laughs> shit, and <laughs> You should get an afro. I basically have one. <laughs> You'd rock it. <laughs> Sorry, Phil, anyway, you were no, saying... <laughs> like, I, I, I don't get you wrong. Like, despite that, I do really like the imagery in it, the music we've spoken mm. about the moments as well actually as much as they aren't necessarily quite as stand out as moments in other films of, of its generation yeah. i think it executes them really well mm. um yeah i i don't know I, I like i i do like it i do really like it but i think i'm just not quite as keen to jump in that sort of cult classic cult favorite campers as perhaps okay. other people i think this is maybe why i call it a bit of a like forgotten classic mm. because I, I don't see it as a cult classic i see it as a beginning maybe for a lot of things but i don't see mm. it as uh, utterly memorable for being that beginning if that makes sense i guess i mean cult classic in the sense that it's got its 
fan base who are probably fervent supporters of it. Mm. Yes, but that is what a cult classic is. Hasn't we? I, do you not agree then? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, like, like... Consider, considering, for example, this film has influenced a lot of you know, like we've mentioned, a lot of horror yeah, directors. Yeah, no, I com- mm. I completely agree with that. But at the same time, like I said to Sarah, at what point can you go right? This thing in a film, what film has that come from? And you would automatically go the Changeling. Yeah, I know for sure. But I think I think the ball falling down the stairs is a definite though. So it doesn't. It's not without those moments. It no, just has absolutely fewer not. Of them. But like the glass smashing against a wall, which I said was iconic. Like mm. I wouldn't necessarily go, oh, it's from the Changeling. Yeah, no, I appreciate sure. and, that. And that's exactly what I've kind of been. I've been agreeing with you kind of throughout the episode. But I'm saying just in terms of the actual directors who have come on record saying they've been influenced by mm. this yeah. film shows there is a strong fan base who consider this film. <laughs> yeah very influential to them mm-hmm. yeah um and you know popular within the the audience but it never reached the mainstream in the same way that the shining or alien or you know exorcist or any other films of that similar it absolutely blows my mind that alien came out the year before this <laughs> i only mention it because we because you, you uh like you... <laughs> it completely blows my mind and and that was like uh, realistically completely mainstream because it was mm-hmm. like action sci-fi horror so mm. It, it ticked a lot of boxes for people, but just uh, the idea that, like, I feel like that was such a massive film, and then for the next year for this film to come out, it just it can never have reached those heights. Mm. And I I realize that's a weird film to be comparing it to because they're mm-hmm. so very different. Well, um, um, to to take it all the way back to the start of the show when I kind of loosely compared it to The Omen, mm. um. I think it has a lot, obviously different, different film. It shares a lot of the themes though, mm. particularly like um, in terms of its protagonist and tragedy being the jumping off point and, you know, the whole film sort of spiraling from that point. Mm. The beginning point of, so, it is, of it is definitely very similar. Yeah. So even those films like The Omen are not, a ghost story or a haunted house movie perhaps the fact that it came out in the shadow of stuff like that just a few years later meant mm. that it did less well mm. Mm. yeah no um, potentially potentially i mean what year did the omen come out it was i would say 76 76 oh no <laughs> i was gonna say 74. i want to say 76 <laughs> you're probably right i mean sarah is although actually right. uh the remake came out on the 6th of the 6th 2006 so it might just be that we're all about sixes <laughs> it's 76 it's yeah. 76 yes. <laughs> 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 Fuck you. um it's my yeah, one talent no, guys. i i, I completely <laughs> I completely agree with you. I think I think that maybe the fact that there have been films with similar um, vibes, for want of mm. a better word, beforehand, maybe meant that this was a bit of a busman's holiday. Um, yeah. Which is a shame, because genuinely it's a really great film. Agreed, yeah. Um, and I would thoroughly recommend... Um, people giving it a watch like mm-hmm. if they haven't it's it's not difficult to get hold of it's on amazon mm-hmm. prime at the moment um mm-hmm. and if not then i mean honestly at this point i'm pretty sure you could watch it on youtube and unlike a lot of the films that we cover when it comes to the po- the question of whether we'd, whether or not we'd recommend it there are a few people i wouldn't recommend this to i think this is kind of a good all-rounder yeah no i do i think i think it's like i said it's it's kind of almost safe and comfortable yeah i would Um, agree with that and it it's a little bit spooky but not too spooky Mm. a little bit scary but not too scary it kind of it ticks a lot of boxes for a lot of different things that people like and realistically everyone likes a mystery yeah and it's notable for kind of being one of the few horror films even for that era that basically has no gore or blood Mm. yeah and it doesn't need it because no. going back to it again, the music informs the plot so well. It does yeah. such a good job of creating tension and creating fear that they don't need to have any of that visual stuff. Mm. They they tell the story through the music as much as they tell it through the plot. Grade A spoops. 
Absolutely. Um, on <laughs> just, that note, oh, can I just quickly say something quickly? <laughs> no, oh, Phil. If I you must, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> it's interesting because it's either going to be, it's either uh, the moments in it are so generic that they are just they're not uh, memorable enough to have uh, been seen in future films like we've spoken about, or the film is so influential that actually the moments in this film have become basically ingrained in the language of what horror movies are. It's, it's, it was almost one or the other, right? It's so weird. Mm. That's it's really, it's, well, this is why I was saying it's really hard to like tell the difference yeah. between the two and to be able to go the changeling informed X, Y, and Z mm. because I mean, did it? Or just was that a thing that had already happened? Or, mm-hmm. Because it's so, like, like I, I keep on coming back to a tap dripping. Just like uh, so many films just have a tap dripping and it's annoying and you go up to find out <laughs> why the tap is dripping and then and there's a fucking ghost. I don't know. Like, uh, but it's it's so common throughout mm. yeah. films of all different genres, actually, not just horror as well. Ultimately, um, my takeaway is um, take more baths, drink more whiskey, ride more horses. And don't burn down amazing houses. Go vegan, be gay, do crimes. <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> On that note, um, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. We love you loads. Um, if you want to support us, check out Ko-Fi or our Patreon, where you can get in stars extra content. <laughs> um, but until then, uh, we will see you later and please stay spooky. Bye, guys. Bye bye. <laughs>